Welcome everyone uh, to this SIAC International Arbitration Webinar, uh, Construction Arbitration Strategies and Practical Tips for Contractors. Uh, today's session is part of the SIAC's Japan series and the discussion will focus on Japanese contractors. Uh, I'm conscious, however, that we have registrants from around the globe and I'm hopeful that the content will be relevant outside of Japan as well. My name's Rob Palmer. I'm a partner in Andreas Arbitration Practice and managing partner of our Singapore office. And I'm joined today by five very experienced practitioners. And I'd like to start with some introductions uh, in the order in which you'll hear from the speakers. We have Paul Sandersham, partner in the dispute resolution team with Clifford Chance in Singapore and head of their contentious energy infrastructure and resources practice for Southeast Asia. We have Chi Nakahara, a Japanese and New York qualified partner with Nishimura and Asahi, specializing in domestic and international arbitration and litigation. We have Derek Lowe, a very experienced construction practitioner with TSMP in Singapore. And Derek works on both contentious and non-contentious mandates. Next, we have Chris Bailey, who heads King & Spalding's Global Disputes Practice in Tokyo, uh, with the core of his practice being in the energy and construction sectors. And last but not least, we have Yoshi Takatori, oh. also New York and Japanese qualified, uh, practicing as an independent arbitrator and mediator, mediator uh, with Kasuma Gaiseki International Law Office. Now, of course, we're holding this webinar in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, which has had very significant implications for many contractors. And I think it's fair to say that while the pipeline of infrastructure projects in Japan and in Asian markets generally remains strong, uh, very considerable uncertainties remain. The trajectory of the pandemic remains uncertain overall. And if we do find ourselves in a protracted economic downturn, contractors could well face more problems in the form of non-payment, in the form of contract cancellations, and in the form of liquidity crunches. And as I suspect many on this webinar already know, those risks have been reflected in the share price declines for many of the listed Japanese contractors. But while we can't ignore the impact of the virus, this is not intended to be a COVID-19 seminar as such. If we look at the implications of the virus for dispute resolution and for arbitration in particular, I think it's fair to say that COVID-19 has not been so much a change agent as an accelerant. Or, in other words, it's speeding up trends that already existed. And in particular, a focus on resolving disputes more quickly and more cost efficiently. And to be clear, a concern with cost and with time of dispute resolution, the cost and time of arbitration is certainly nothing new. To give just one example, the 2019 Queen Mary International Arbitration Survey on construction disputes highlighted the need to come up with more effective ways of resolving lower value disputes. In that survey, 43% of the in-house counsel in the construction sector who responded, believed that disputes needed to be valued above 11 million US dollars to be even worth pursuing in arbitration. So I think in many ways, all that COVID has done has been to make those concerns more pressing for contractors. So it's against that background that we'll be giving a series of five mini presentations today, each around 10 minutes or so in length, and after each of these, we'll pause and there'll be the opportunity to ask questions. And you can submit these through Zoom using the Q&A function. The first of these three presentations, or the first three rather, of these presentations will focus on issues of procedural efficiency. Paul will get us underway with a discussion on the efficient management of documents. Nakahara-san will then discuss issues relating to the use of experts in construction disputes. And then Derek will speak about using preliminary issues to resolve delay-related claims in a more efficient manner. 
We'll then move to two more update focus sessions. Chris will speak about strategies for dealing with COVID related force majeure claims. And Takatori san will close with discussion of recent developments in Japanese ADR. So much as I do enjoy the sound of my own voice, I'm going to pause now. I'll hand over to Paul for the first of our many presentations, this on document management. Paul, over to you. Well, thank you, Rob, for the kind introduction and uh, welcome everyone uh, this afternoon. It's a great privilege to be here to present to all of you. I'm going to share some thoughts, having been involved in numerous construction arbitrations for international contractors working on different projects across the world, including Japanese parties. And I'll start off by mentioning something, that there are two unique features of construction arbitrations. Firstly, you'll know that they involve voluminous documents. So we've got the usual correspondence, you have site meeting minutes, you have the contracts, subcontracts, as built drawings, notices. And that's one unique feature of construction arbitrations. The second unique point is that you will find that the hearing of the disputes usually take place many years after the project is completed. And therefore, maintaining good documentary records is a must. And why do I say that? First of all, memories fade with the passing of time. People on the project are no longer in the employment of the parties by the time the matter goes for hearing. The only contemporaneous record of what actually happened years ago during the project are documents. And you will find that tribunals tend to place great weight on contemporaneous documents as compared to factual testimony of witnesses on matters that may have happened many, many years ago. And as I mentioned, memories do fade. Further, you will find nowadays that tribunals tend to take a dim view of a party that does not produce documents that are requested by the other side. Uh, it's quite common now for document disclosure to take the form of a red fund schedule with one party seeking production by the other side and the other side having to respond. And where a party fails to provide those documents or give an adequate explanation as to why it has been unable to locate those documents for production, there's always the danger of the tribunal being asked to draw an adverse inference against a party who is unable to produce those relevant documents. And just to share some stories, in one case, we had a matter where the tribunal actually told off the claimant contractor for not taking its disclosure obligations seriously. And what had happened is that the contractor had delegated the task of collating documents to the most junior member of the team. And when he was questioned by opposing counsel and the tribunal why he did not produce the documents requested, he said he kept asking his bosses and seniors for these documents, but they kept telling him to get lost and go away. Now, this is not actually unusual in, in most societies. If your boss tells you not to bother me, you tend to go away quietly. And but the reaction of the tribunal was quite justified and they were very displeased with the contractor for such conduct, commenting that such an important task should not have been delegated to someone so junior who would have been expected to face roadblocks when asking his seniors to produce documents. So that's the first warning. Now in the same case, what transpired was that the project documents were not kept on the company server but each member of the project team corresponded using their Gmail accounts and the correspondence and records were kept in hard, well, it's soft copy in each person's own laptop. Now, by the time of the hearing, many of the project team had left the employment of the contractor. As such, there were large gaps in the documentation and this, the contractor therefore struggled to prove its case as well as defend the claims from the owner. Now, the problem was compounded by the fact that the contractor's system also had an automatic document deletion uh, protocol where documents were delete, deleted after two years from the time they were created. So that gave a further problem because the matter only went for hearing about four years after the project had ended. So a, a rather short uh, document deletion time period. And again, a, a moral to the story, these are things you really need to look at. So I think 
the po simple point to be made about this is, is ensure that you have a good document management system because you do not know when you will need these documents for the purposes of a dispute or arbitration that tends to arise much later. It is, of course, much better to save your documents electronically rather than in hard copy files because it makes locating the documents much easier. And as lawyers, we would like to tell you it helps a lot when we can get the documents electronically rather than having to go physically to a warehouse and dig through files covered with lots of droppings of various creatures and animals. So our preference is electronic documents. The other point which I wish to make relates indirectly to documents, but it's something that is more uh, slightly different, and that is the language. And I, I sort of share an observation from an arbitration I did, which involved the Korean and a Mongolian party, and where most of the witnesses could only speak their own native language, but were corresponding in the English language. And in the course of the cross-examination, it became apparent to the tribunal from the answers given by the witnesses in relation to documents that one of the main reasons for the disputes was the miscommunication between the parties. And I remember the member of the tribunal making this rather intuitive comment. He said, it strikes me that all the disputes have come about because both of you don't seem to understand each other. And why in the world would a Korean and Mongolian company decide to communicate with each other in a language neither of you are fluent in? Now, it, it was an interesting comment, but absolutely spot on. And, and I'm not suggesting that there's an easy answer to this situation where parties are from different jurisdictions. However, perhaps some thought should go into it, and perhaps, perhaps parties could write in their own language and have it translated, rather than seeking to draft in a language that they are not familiar with, which only gives rooms for disputes later if the intent is not accurately reflected in the correspondence. So we're seeing more and more uh, parties from different countries working on projects across the world. Of course, the tendency is to sort of adopt English as the language of contract and communications. But, you know, I do pose a question whether that's sometimes the best idea where the parties may not be entirely fluent in that language. So th that's what I wanted to cover. And perhaps I'll hand the time back to Rob now. Um, and I hope this has been a useful sort of brief uh, two pointers on documentation in construction disputes. Rob? Paul, th thanks for that. And there's a, there's a number of things we might unpack coming out of the, um, the, the overview that you provided. But, but let me start by, by asking you this, which is that one of the features I've noticed in my own work with Japanese contractors is that perhaps because of a somewhat less claims-focused approach than in some cultures, there may not be as much attention to creating proper paper trails, whether that's in the form of complying with notice requirements or whether it's putting in place suitable document management and retention systems to document progress. Is that consistent with the sort of trend that you see in your own practice and, and if it is, is that something that you have seen changing over time? Well, you're, you're absolutely, Rob, uh, absolutely right, Rob. Uh, and it is a, a quite a common problem. I mean, just sharing out my own observations. It's quite often we have clients coming to us and telling us we have these claims to make uh, for additional payment and, and additional time and such. And we ask them, have you complied with the requisite notices under the standard forms of contract, you know, for instance, FIDIC, you need to give the relevant notices or you are time barred. And quite often, sheepishly, the response is, uh, we, we did not give the relevant notices. And the question we ask is, why not? And they say, well, we didn't want to upset the owner. <laughs> well, we say, well, I mean, you didn't want the upset owner, but now we're having to advance a case where we could be stalled right at the start because we haven't satisfied the condition precedence uh, to uh, making a claim. And, you know, of course, at that point in time, the parties will say, well, you know, we, we thought the, 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 our counterparty, in this case, the owner would, would be, you know, nice to us and, you know, and, and not impose such uh, restrictive um, impositions or restrictions on us. And, you know, we thought they would give us an extension of time. But yes, that's well all, well all and good during the project. But it, when the dispute breaks out, you know, parties will turn to rely on their strict legal rights. So, Rob, yeah, I mean, I think it's clear to, to 
you know, all listening that it's important that you give the requisite notices uh, and you maintain a proper documentary record of your entitlements and claims. I mean, the other problem is where one side writes to the, you know, the contractor and says, you know, you, you, your, your work is bad and defective. And when it's received, such correspondence is put at the bottom of the entry without any response. And when the matter goes for arbitration four or five years later, all the tribunal has is one side of the story without a response. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the tribunal tends to place greater weight on contemporaneous documents produced at that point in time rather than someone's response, which is given four to five years later at the hearing. Good night. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. That, that, I mean, that, that's helpful. And perhaps I can um, can throw this open to the Japanese, or at least the Japan-based panelists that we have. And you mentioned, Paul, some of the difficulties that arise from the situation when non-native speakers adopt English as the language of communication on a project. Um, equally difficult, though, I think, is where English-speaking arbitrators find themselves dealing with a large volume of documents in, say, Japanese or whatever the, the native language of the parties is. So, so perhaps, to, again, turning to our Japan-based panelists, Yoshichi, Chris, do you see Japanese parties, Japanese contractors in particular, grappling with this issue and taking any steps to, to deal with it? Uh, yeah, um, <clears throat> this is Yoshi speaking. And actually, the um, I think that like you know, global construction companies has uh, quite good you know legal department and who are who has the <clears throat> English speaking capabilities and they're waving the documents or something. But uh, you're right, the some companies having the <clears throat> struggling on the uh, reviewing and the communications, they can just defer to a uh, English speaking you know international lawyer. Uh, who can handle the arbitration. But I think uh, especially for the construction area, uh, just related to the, uh, uh, you know, coming up uh, question under my presentation, but uh, uh, mediation and arbitrations and such, you know, combination could be quite um, good resolution uh, could be coming up if you have a good um, in-house, you know, who has uh, quite uh, familiarity on the uh, their business and the constructions uh, technology side as well as the legal side you know so the point is the not only the English speaking capabilities but also with the deep understanding of uh, your com company's business uh, so in that sense I think the uh, legal um, you know in-house's um, importance is quite big I think and uh, some Japanese global construction company have those capabilities but uh, other companies should have um, should retain some, you know, Japanese international lawyer who can supplement onto that, I think. Yoshi, thanks. And as I say, there was a lot that we, that, that we could have delved into coming out of that presentation, but I am conscious of time. We've had various questions submitted already in relation to DABs, ARB, Med, ARB, and so on, which we will try to address um, probably in the, in the context of, of Yoshi's discussion that we'll finish the session. But, but let's turn now, if we can, to our next mini presentation. Um, and I'm sure that many of the participants that we have are aware of the importance that expert evidence plays in most construction arbitrations. So now Nakahara-san is going to discuss strategies for dealing with expert evidence and I think advance some suggestions for making that process run as efficiently as possible. Over to you. Thank you, Rob. So, hello everyone. I am Chie Nakahara, a partner at Mishimura Asahi based in Tokyo. I have been fortunate enough to handle a considerable amount of construction arbitrations in my career. And let me share some of my thoughts and uh, observations with you today. Uh, for international arbitrations in the construction sector, the perception is that it takes long, sometimes too long, and it costs a lot to pursue an arbitration to a final award. Considering the majority of the construction arbitrations are characterized by large volume of 
volume of documents, which was uh, discussed by Paul earlier, and also numerous experts relating to various technical issues. So it would be helpful to seek how the efficient use of experts can help make construction arbitrations quicker and less costly. So today, let me talk about the efficient use of experts in construction arbitrations. Firstly, I will discuss how the expert reports shall be submitted to streamline the expert evidence. As I mentioned earlier, construction arbitrations almost always entail the party appointed experts and also their expert report submissions. And that could take a lot of time and cost. Considering the construction arbitrations involve various highly complex technical issues to streamline the, to streamline the expert evidence is essential for the efficient proceedings. So the rule 101 is that experts shall provide opinions on the basis of the same facts. And it is advisable that all the factual evidence, both documentary and witness, shall be available before the expert witness provides their report. So to accomplish that, the tribunal should draw up the terms of reference of the experts or to request the parties to agree a settlement a statement of the issues and facts upon which expert evidence is required. If not, the experts should be transparent about the terms of reference or instructions they have received from their clients for the parties and also for the tribunal to obtain useful opinions from experts. Also, it is ideal that mutual list of questions to be answered by the appointed experts is established. Further, expert conferencing is also seen to be a useful tool to streamline the expert evidence, as they should eventually agree about most things if they are truly independent. And then joint expert reports should be drafted between the experts. And there is a question, should joint expert reports precede or succeed individual expert reports? The answer will be, it is case by case. However, it is likely to be desirable or ideal if experts discuss their views with each other before preparing their individual reports. The reason why that I said likely to be ideal if the experts discuss their views before is that after experts issue their reports, their written reports, they often become more committed to their written position and less likely to be open to changing their with, uh, written views. But if no discussions are held before the individual reports are presented, uh, such joint discussions shall still certainly be held afterwards to make the points of disagreement clear. So the drafting of joint report, that forces constructive progress and makes the points clear where the tribunal and also the parties can use to focus efforts on what they need from the experts. So such joint reports shall identify the areas of agreement and disagreement and the reasons for such differences. So ideally, the list of mutual questions shall be established and joint discussion shall be held, ideally before uh, the individual report submission, and then the joint report stating the areas of agreement and disagreement shall be made. Then the individual reports shall be produced. Such individual reports shall focus on the area of disagreement. So such procedures for the joint expert meetings and the reports to be submitted thereafter should be agreed up front. Uh, typically, it is agreed that all discussions during the joint expert meetings are privileged and are not to be disclosed until ag agreement is reached. So next, another point that I would like to uh, uh, propose here is that I would like to introduce the use of arbitrator consultant. Uh, Dr. Bernhard Meyer has written a very useful article on this matter. And I myself have encountered several cases where such consultant could be of great use uh, for the efficient proceedings. Typical areas that the arbitrator consultants can be utilized will be such as critical path issues or damage calculations, both of which are often disputed in construction arbitrations. The arbitrator consultant is not appointed 
as an expert or acting as an expert. He does not produce any written report and does not exercise any decision-making power within the tribunal. Then what does he do? What he does is an arbitrator consultant assists arbitrators to translate the tribunal's factual and legal decisions into the technical or commercial language of the contract or awards or vice versa. So the tasks, tasks of an arbitrator consultant may be uh, such as answering technical or commercial questions from the tribunal, assisting the tribunal in their preparations for hearings, uh, assisting the tribunal in coordinating the use of party appointed experts, uh, participating at hearings and assisting the tribunal's questioning process with respect to uh, party appointed expert witnesses. And they can also assist with the drafting of the terms of reference for a tribunal appointed expert if you need, you are going to uh, uh, make the terms of reference for uh, the tribunal appointed experts. They can also assist in drafting of certain parts of the award to avoid technical or commercial errors. So by utilizing such arbitrator consultants, the parties can save time and money compared to the tribunal appointed experts and arbitrator consultants can be a flexible information tool for the tribunal, thus assuring the technical or commercial soundness or accuracy of the final award with much less process time and cost. Also, if you think about a case where the parties are offering only two options, but the tribunal is unwilling to choose either option A or B, but would like to go for option C. Due to the technical nature of the dispute, in such case, the arbitrator consultant can work as a tool to assist the tribunal in drafting the third option, for example, uh, with adjusted formula and to recalculate and translate the tribunal's third option into the technical language of the contract or the award. In such case, by appointing an arbitrator consultant, the tribunal does not have to appoint, it, appoint the tribunal's expert, and they can also avoid to prematurely disclose the tribunal's thinkings or findings to the parties, and they do not have to wait for another written expert report another time, so they don't have to organize a hearing concerning the new expert report. They do not have to conduct another round of closing submissions, and it can shorten the proceedings dramatically. And the substantial cost can be saved by the use of arbitrator consultant under this kind of circumstance. Now, it all sounds like a beautiful picture, but I need to point out that the appointment of an arbitrator consultant may also uh, entail certain risks, particularly for the parties, such as the lack of transparency of what that arbitrator consultant actually does within the tribunal or the lack of control over his findings. Also, there are certain additional costs for such services. So with regard to the appointment of an arbitrator consultant, it is important that certain key principles are clearly stated and adhered to by the various players, especially the duty to decide must always remain with the, with the arbitrators. The arbitrators cannot hand over such duty to anyone else. The tribunal's decisions were not influenced by the arbitrator consultants. Therefore, the tribunal must ensure that no decision-making power is transferred to such arbitrator consultants. Rather, arbitrator consultants is used as a translator or the converter of the tribunal's decisions to the specific technical or commercial language of the contract in dispute. That is <clears throat> one thing that needs to be clear from the outset. So in practice, usually arbitrator consultants can be invited to join a deliberation session of the tribunal only after the tribunal had made up its mind. So uh, how the process of submission of expert reports shall be set out and controlled, and also the use of arbitrator consultant was the two things that I, I introduced that could contribute to streamlining the expert evidence in construction arbitrations today. Thank you. Thanks, Nagahara-san. And, and I suppose many of the audience are going to be familiar with the use of experts but probably less so with the use of 
arbitrator consultants. And I know that the 96 English Act, for example, talks yeah. about the use of assessors, yeah. uh, yeah. which I think is a, a, a parallel concept. Mm -hmm. Do you know how, were you able to make any comments about the legal framework in other jurisdictions um, yes. and sort of implications for that if parties are looking to go down this path? Thank you, Rob. Um, you are so right about the UK Arbitration Act 96 is the exception, but most of the arbitration laws and most institutional rules do not stipulate a right of the tribunal to appoint an arbitrator consultant without party consent. Uh, my understanding is that uh, CX rules are silent as to the possibility of the tribunal appointing an arbitrator consultant without the party's consent, but the rules do not exclude such appointment either. And IBA rules of evidence deal with the tribunal appointed experts in Article 6, I think, but they do not contain any provision on arbitrator consultants. So the tribunal may only appoint an arbitrator consultant after the parties agree to such course of action. And it is always recommended to have the party's consent and agreement on the procedure. Great, thank you. Thank you. And, and I think that, that, that makes a really nice segue in many ways into our next um, presentation today. Um, given that, that Derek's proposing to talk about um, the use of preliminary issues in delay claims, a, an area where we're frequently dealing with uh, expert evidence. So, so maybe I'll, I'll ask uh, Derek if you could, uh, could step up now and, um, and expand on those points a bit further. Of course. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Hi, everyone. It's an honor and a privilege to be speaking here today. <clears throat> so I, I think the most important thing to keep in mind is how we can use preliminary issues in arbitrations for the purposes of saving time and cost. Now, as Rob earlier mentioned, practically all constructions dispute involve delay-related claims. Now, as everybody knows, delay-related claims are, are frequently the most fiercely contested and disputed as they involve the largest or greatest claim amounts or sums, whether in the form of liquidated damages or in the form of prolongation costs. So as a result, what we often find in construction arbitrations is that delay-related claims see the most sub-issues raised both in terms of law and in fact. Now, if we consider that in his context and Rob's earlier claim that to make an arbitration fruitful, the dispute must amount to at least $11 million. You can imagine the amount of work, time, and professional fees that would be involved in undertaking such a claim. <clears throat> now, one of the points, and this follows on from what uh, Nakahara-san said earlier, is that, and also from what uh, Mr. Sandoshim said earlier, one of the key points is that delay-related claims involve collating documents and preparing factual evidence that is both involved and very time-consuming. Now, I believe that a considerable amount of time and cost can be saved if the parties are able to identify and agree amongst themselves at a very early stage the key areas of dispute in relation to delay claims and to have these preliminary issues addressed before the arbitrators as soon as possible. Now, what is typical is that you'll find in almost all delayed claims that there'll be arguments about time at large. There'll be arguments, as Mr. Sandoshan pointed out earlier, there'll be arguments in relation to whether the notice provisions were complied with. And as a related argument is whether there was any waiver or estoppel by the person seeking to rely on the notice provisions as you would find in the fitted contract. So what you, will, you, will, what you can uh, resolve also is how concurrent delays are to, 
are to be treated as a matter of principle or as a matter of law. Now, as many of you know, some, only some contracts expressly deal with the issue of concurrent delays. Many contracts are silent as to whether concurrent delays should be assessed in a particular manner or whether it should be taken into account. And finally, the, 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 there's an issue of float and who owns the float or who has the benefit of the float. And this is also frequently an issue that's raised in construction disputes between the parties. Now, as Nakahara-san said earlier, one of the most involved and costliest components in construction arbitrations is the cost of the independent expert evidence on delay and how best to deal with this issue. So in that context, the, pre the preparation of expert evidence is a very useful way to illustrate how time and cost can be minimized or saved by having these common points of contentions addressed early on a preliminary manner, namely time at large, compliance with notice provisions, concurrent delays, and ownership flow. Now, so imagine if you will, how early resolution of these common disputes could have an outright benefit in terms of the preparation of your expert reports. Now, firstly, if time at large is an issue, once the arbitrators de determine or decide as a matter of principle, whether time is or isn't at large, then the expert need only undertake one analysis and provide his expert evidence on whether A, time, on the basis of A, time is at large, or B, time is not at large. So instead of having the expert provide alternate or alternative views, one on the basis that time is at large, one on the basis that it isn't, you just need the expert to prepare the one that has been decided by the arbitrators. Now, next, if there are challenges as to the validity of notifications, i.e., whether delay claims number one to 10 are valid, invalid, because they comply or do not comply with the notice provisions. If the issue is decided such that the arbitrators decide or deter determine that delay claims number five, seven, and nine are non-compliant in terms of the notices and cannot be considered, then your expert need only look at number one, two, three, four, six, eight, and 10. He doesn't have to give any opinion on delay notices five, seven, and nine. Similarly, if the issue of concurrent delay is addressed early, then the expert's evidence can be similarly directed in the in a manner that is already awarded. Namely, do you use the dominant cause approach or do you just go on the basis of decisions such as in Henry Boot and Mao Maison? Now, lastly, the issue of float. Float, of course, sometimes is not an issue that arises, but it frequently does. The issue of float is also subject to a lot of unnecessary argument and contention in delay-related claims. If the issue is determined or decided early, then the expert will be able to address his report in and take into account who owns the float and how float is to be applied. So if you, if you look at it from that context, having these four basic or key questions addressed very early on in construction arbitrations would save a lot of time in terms of the documents that you need, will save a lot of time in terms of the expert preparation, and indeed it, uh, save a lot of time in relation to the expert's evidence and the time required for hearing both factual and expert evidence as well. Now, there is, a, there is also a related benefit in having these issues determined early. Once these issues are determined early, 
parties will have a better sense of the strengths and weaknesses of their case in relation to delay. And once the parties have a clearer sense of their position, they will be better placed to decide whether they want to pursue their delay claims or indeed whether they would be minded to have negotiations with their counterparty to decide how they want to take matters forward. And as from my experience, having these four issues resolved early very often leads to matters being resolved outside of the arbitration framework. In other words, the parties are incentivized to then have discussions or mediation or out and out settlements. Okay, so I I strongly advise that where parties are able to, to decide to have these four key issues decided on a preliminary basis. But by no means are uh, preliminary issues confined to these four areas. I mean, you could agree on issues in relation to variations, how to value variations, or how you treat prolongation costs as well. So I've come to the end of my short little presentation. Thank you. Well, that, that, that's really valuable, Derek. And there's some really, um, I mean, you made a really persuasive case there for the use of preliminary issues to achieve both cost and time savings in the arbitration process. But ju just before our audience rushes off and starts berating their own external counsel as to why they have not been pushing for preliminary issues in their current arbitrations, <laughs> could you make a few comments or, or speak to the sorts of questions that are not suitable for resolution in this way? Okay, so some of, some of the issues that are not ideal for preliminary issues usually relate to, as Nakahara-san said, technical issues. So as to the issue of what caused the collapse, what caused the crack, that does not lend itself to preliminary issues. The other issue that sometimes, sometimes does not lend itself readily to be resolved at, on a preliminary basis in relation to delay would be interactions with other contractors. Those can be very, very difficult and very, very involved. So when you try to apportion um, causation, where you have third party contractors involved, it becomes very, very difficult because you would have to involve the third party contractor agreeing to how you would want to characterize or apportion it. And this is typically uh, the case for very involved complex infrastructure projects, for example, tunnels with two separate contractors doing two separate parts of a tunnel, tunneling towards the middle and trying to meet. And in the process, um, one causing damage to the other or one causing some kind of delay to the other due to imperfect engineering. Okay. Great. Look, let, let's turn then to what I described earlier as the update sessions of this webinar. Um, and, and the first of these is the discussion that Chris will be leading around strategies and tips for dealing with COVID-related force majeure claims. I, I, I would add that we've already had uh, questions from the audience as to the extent to which um, the pandemic constitutes an event of force majeure. I'm not even going to attempt to venture any sort of answer there. I'll leave all of that to Chris. Uh, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Rob, and um, thank you to the, uh, my fellow panellists and, of course, also SIAC for the opportunity uh, to speak to you all today. Um, I'm going to address the COVID pandemic, um, as Rob indicates, um, by way of certain trends that I've seen as a construction disputes practitioner here in Japan, um, and also with some practical recommendations that I hope will help any contractors in the audience um, deal with issues that they see before them. Um, I'll start very briefly just with a couple of trends that I've seen over my time working in this area. Um, I originally trained and practiced in London uh, and moved out to Asia in 2006. 
I spent most of that time practicing here in Japan, but also had opportunities to be on the ground in Thailand and Singapore. So no Southeast Asia world. Um, there, there has definitely been a change over that period, in my opinion, um, addressing one of the comments that was raised earlier in the way that Japanese contractors in particular have managed projects and dealt with disputes. I think there's a particular distinction to be drawn between the way the Jap domestic Japanese construction industry operates and perhaps the challenges that those Japanese contractors face when they move out of the domestic space into the international arena. Um, that was particularly noticeable a few years ago because there I think had been a certain degree of um, looking inward um, towards the domestic work for Japanese contractors um, that arose from a variety of issues. Um, some had experienced difficulties overseas, um, there was increasing pressure from Chinese and Korean um, contractors on pricing projects. Um, we saw a lot of contractors' resources taken up with the post Fukushima rebuild, and also a lot of the work that was going into the infrastructure for the Olympics that unfortunately should have been commencing in the coming days. Um, uh, but I think a lot of those trends have passed and we've seen a lot of Japanese contractors looking overseas um, to their future, to where their future profits are gonna come from. And there has been a big drive and there was a Fitch Solutions report that came out last year that estimated that Japanese contractors were involved in projects to the tune of about $367 billion uh, in Southeast Asia and that their engagement there outstripped even that of the Chinese contractors. So I think we have seen a move from the domestic to the international. Um, and with that, perhaps challenges that um, um, Japanese contractors don't experience domestically um, becoming somewhat realized through that transition. Um, if I may, before turning to, to, to COVID, um, just three quick stories that illuminate that. Um, I had a fascinating conversation with a Japanese um, construction arbitrator who covers both domestic work and international. And he said his experience of the domestic was vastly different to the international. Um, and that's principally in his view, and, and I must say it, it was just his view, that in the domestic arena, there's a very close relationship between the owners and the contractors. And there's very much a view to a series of projects rather than simply enforcing contractual obligations on the project uh, underway. And with that, there's an expectation of a fair price to be paid for fair work. And, and, and with that, there's not heavy documentation, there's not heavy legal argument. And, and he indicated that actually in terms of Japanese court decisions, there are very, very few in the construction arena. And it's for those reasons. Um, second of the three stories is that one, one of my clients who I'm very, very fond of um, was describing the factual background to a particular case. And he made a, a point that the US contractor on the project was hammering in notices day after day, much the irritation of everyone else involved in the project. Um, and that the Japanese party was much more conciliatory, constructive, and working together with the parties on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, he made very, very valid points through that introduction, but interestingly, the lack of notices provided by that particular Japanese contractor um, became a real problem as that dispute ran forward. So striking that balance, as much as we realize good working relationships are important, uh, must be done. And the last one, um, which, which really sticks out, is um, on, on, on a different matter. We were running through some of the key points and there was a particular crucial issue that we believed, if correct, must be reflected in the monthly reports. Uh, and in particular, at certain of the meeting minutes. And when we looked at the relevant uh, reports and meeting minutes, it simply wasn't there. And when that was put to the fact witness in question, his response was, yes, well, that was a crucial issue and the agreed position would have embarrassed my counterpart internally. So we agreed that we wouldn't document it. And of course, you know, that is a very reasonable position between two people dealing with a key issue under tremendous amount of pressure on a project. And I suspect those sort of acts of goodwill ran both ways. 
But as, as, as pleasant and as decent as that was, it, it was a fundamental problem in proceeding with the case because we were missing a key piece of contemporaneous evidence. Um, and, and you can see these themes running together uh, in the way that traditional, perhaps Japanese contracting behavior has impacted their ability to successfully pursue international arbitration. Um, but hopefully um, you can see through these stories that I think there's a quite a dramatic change underway. Uh, Takatori Sensei referenced that the big contractors have increasingly developed legal de uh, departments. I certainly would agree with that. There was a question about language earlier I'm always tremendously impressed with the level of English spoken amongst many of the leading contractors, and I don't see that as a key issue at this point in time. Um, but I think what we are facing, and to turn to COVID in the time that I have remaining, um, I think we're seeing two issues coming up. One is a very dramatic impact on projects as a result of COVID. And the second is that all parties involved in these projects whether through the specific project uh, that one's looking at or through their wider balance sheet are coming under increasing financial strain. And that is seeing them behave differently in the context of enforcing rights, protecting their own position and dealing with their counterparts. Um, and with that in mind, if we look specifically at how, you know, guiding and recommending steps for contractors to take, particularly in the context of this seminar, Japanese contractors. You know, I, I think in terms of the Asia region, if you look at the trends in coronavirus, um, India is, is obviously the jurisdiction that jumps out. And it's a jurisdiction that Japan's heavily invested in. And it's arguably, and I know we've got some Indian uh, 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 audience members to, to, today, it can be a challenging jurisdiction for a non-Indian party to, to operate from a distance in. Um, but we do see other jurisdictions with, with severe impacts in Pakistan, Bangladesh, Indonesia and Philippines, you know, China, of course, would be just a few. But what can the contractor do when they're facing issues? And, and I think there are a number of things before we get to the inevitable force majeure. One is stay in touch, communicate and more than ever build relationships with the project teams of the owner party upstream and the subcontractors downstream. Uh, that is critical because you'll have to make decisions fast and you need those relationships to be smooth. Second, know your contract. And that's not just know the force majeure clause. We see many relevant clauses coming to light. Uh, many, many contracts will contain audit clauses, which will allow the uh, owner to audit the books and records of the contractor. We'll see schedule requirements. Um, you know, it's key that contractors keep up to speed there because you know, the, the critical path method um, reports, the 30 day look forwards, there'll be essential records should disputes flare, flare up in the future. Of course, change notices, uh, if you're looking to change the price, completion date um, or schedule, and inevitably uh, a mitigation clause. But in the context of force majeure, and, um, and I'm gonna add in here, increasingly change in law clauses. Um, as Robert indicated earlier, these aren't, and it sounds like we'll have a few questions, so I might not spend too much time here. Force majeure is actually a very difficult for a contractor clause to satisfy. Uh, it will depend heavily on the drafting in the contract, um, but, particularly if you look at some civil law jurisdictions, there may be remedies in the civil law statutes. Uh, France, China, certainly two jurisdictions that have such provisions. Uh, we have a number of cases on involving French law. And interestingly, under their statute, they actually require impossibility of performance. So from a causation perspective, you know, we're looking at an, an, a breach, uh, an operation perspective, we're looking potentially at very high thresholds. In order to meet these records will be critical. Uh, and one of the trends I've seen over the last month or two is the initial rush for force majeure clauses. Um, we're actually seeing contra uh, contractors increasingly turn to change in law provisions. Um, there can be a number of advantages. Um, there can be easier access to money for one and the thresholds to satisfy to operate the clause can on occasion be 
much lower than they find in the uh, parallel force majeure provision. Um, I think with all of that, I, I'm probably going to shoot out four further recommendations until we deal with some questions that I think might drill down on some detail. One is, once you've found those provisions, enforce your contract. Um, as good as your working relationship may be, as strong as your friendship may be with your counterpart, it's going to be critical in these periods. We don't know how long COVID is going to last. We don't know the final financial stress that all the parties will come under. And in all likelihood, we will see more cases going to arbitration than would have been previously the case. You will need to prove your cases in, the, in arbitration, and that need, requires you to make those documents enforce the contract. Um, gather the facts, critical um, for all the good reasons we've heard on documents and experts and, and others. Um, I would say one word of warning is be careful what you put in non-privileged communications particularly those internal communications where you might be firing emails or increasingly WhatsApp messages between colleagues. Think before you go into print. Mitigation's key, particularly uh, in an FM force majeure context. So be warned, you will need to take steps even if it costs you money. Um, and a combined sign off is check the notice provisions. And that's not just under your EPC contract, um, but also you should be looking at the insurance contracts you've got in place. Um, you don't want to find yourself unable to make a valid claim uh, under those provisions. Um, and I hope I haven't taken too long. Um, and, and, and Rob, your guide is on questions for both myself and the rest of the panel. But hopefully that's a run through of my experience here in Japan and also what I'm seeing coming out of the COVID period in particular in relation to force majeure and project disruption. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. And we, we do have time, I'm pleased to say, for, for a couple of, of questions on, on this. And one of the points that an audience member raised related to whether there was anything unique to a force majeure claim arising from COVID-19 as compared to any other cause, whether it be a tsunami, an earthquake, uh, a war, whatever it might be. In, in your experience, are there any factors you could point to in, in that regard? Or given that we're speaking here about, at least in most common law systems, a creature of contract, are we talking here about an event that is dealt with exactly as any other intervening sort of act? Yeah, it, it, it's a good question. Um, I, I think when, um, when you look at most of the sort of certainly common law drafted uh, force majeure clauses, which, which are you know come most commonly across my desk, um, certainly English law is is prevalent in, in the big sort of EPC contracts today, um, and I think the drafting follows. Um, we are seeing epidemic and pandemic actually in there already. So as to whether you can get within the provisions uh, of the force majeure, I, I think that first step, um, depending on your drafting, um, I, I would say is on the whole, not being the biggest problem that we faced. Um, what we're seeing, particularly from a contractor perspective, and I think what makes this interesting, is actually getting from the activation of the force majeure clause to showing the specific impacts on the project. Uh, and of course, there may be some impacts, but it's working out when they began, what the impact actually was, how long that runs for. Um, and as I say, it, with, with that is a key to getting, if you can, early agreement on the way forward with your owner, with your subcontractors. And, and I think the pace at which this is happening and the pressure which everyone is under it is making this rather unique. Um, because we're not seeing um, a single isolated incident um, that has a specific impact on that project. Um, we're seeing just a myriad of factors reigning in that are affecting projects in different ways. And just to, to pick up that point, one thing we're seeing in our own practice is our parties, in essence, attempting to rely on 
economic hardship type situations dressed up in the language of COVID-19. And that, at least in my experience, is often a very, very difficult thing to, um, to succeed on in the, in, in the context of many of the standard form construction contracts. Interested in hearing though, Chris, or, or any of the other panelists, whether that echoes your own experiences. Yeah, um, Rob, I mean, perhaps I'll just add on to what Chris said, apart from looking at your contract for relief, I think the other relevant consideration is that many governments across the world are passing legislation specifically to deal with the impact of COVID. So if your contract doesn't help you, you may want to seek legal advice as to whether there's a law in place that helps you. I mean, you, you would be familiar that in Singapore specifically, uh, we have a, a COVID Temporary Measures Act and it was passed, you know, uh, specifically to deal with the impact of, of COVID on businesses and there are special sections to deal particularly with the construction industry and, and you know, they're quite important because you, you can't call a performance bond during this moratorium period, your inability to perform is excused and any delay that is materially caused by COVID, you're not liable for that. Uh, so that, that's clearly another avenue where parties may want to consider in terms of seeking relief, um, where they are una unable to perform the obligations uh, because of COVID. This is just speaking, the, yeah, that good point. I, I think the, uh, the key is, uh, could be kind of, you know, the causation between the uh, uh, COVID-19 itself and kind of a uh, non-performance impossibility. You know, such causation, a reasonable causation could involve some human beings' business judgment. If, I mean, you know, due to the um, economic considerations or regulations or uh, business income judgment or something, then uh, such how to determine the causation in certain or various jurisdiction could be the key. So even if you say COVID-19 issue, that COVID-19 issue and definition could be different. And then uh, comparing between the um, common law system and the uh, civil law system or something. So it's quite complexity. So, so in, in that sense, I think the, you know, such a, how to determine the uh, such liability and the mitigations uh, could be the key for this area. And, uh, uh, compared to the uh, common law, in which you have to have uh, very detailed um, provisions and a contract, but uh, uh, relatively speaking, the in civil law jurisdictions, you know, a lot of the interpretation rule for those uh, definitions as well. I think. Um, if if I may add uh, to some of the points that has been touched upon regarding the practical tips that the Japanese contractors uh, can utilize is that um, it's a small point, but if something has been changed at the project that affects the progress of the project, uh, of course, it's good to check out the contract. It's good to look at the legislation, but legislations, but proper and accurate contemporaneous documentation will be the key. Proper daily reports shall be made. The comparison of the pre and post COVID will have to be made eventually if the disputes would go to arbitration. So the contractors should be documenting, recording, for example, actual man hour by site, and also the measures that have been implemented, implemented due to COVID-19 and how that is affecting the man hour or the productivity, for example. Maybe it's a cleaning process that would reduce the productivity. Maybe it is a restriction on the maximum number of people who can work on the site. Whatever, make the accurate and proper documentation now. Then you will have to prove with the evidence that due to COVID-19, such delay occurred and that, that shall be excused or extension of time shall be granted. Some good advice there. Thanks, everyone. Let's turn then to the, the final session that we have today, which is Takatori-san providing a, a, an update on developments in Japanese ADR. And Takatori-san, as, as part of that, could I ask you also please to address mm -hmm. in your discussion two questions that we've had come in from the, the audience already. Sure. Uh, one of those relates to the attitudes of Japanese parties to uh, ARP Med ARP. Oh, 
Yeah. And then the second question relates to attitudes and take up of dispute, uh, dispute adjudication boards. Thanks. Sure. Yeah, that's uh, included in my presentation actually. So uh, my name is Yoshi Takatori. I'm very um, honored to uh, have opportunity to, um, you know, for, for this uh, very interesting topic. And uh, uh, actually I'm the executive um, board member of the uh, uh, Japan Arbitrators Associations, as well as the co convener of the Chartered Institute Arbitrators, which is uh, arbitrators and mediators training institution. Actually, this CIR is established by the construction engineer, not lawyers. So uh, for those uh, construction area, you know, a lot of the um, <clears throat> disputes historically and uh, uh, also you know, a lot of the uh, uh, tips for the how to resolve it. So um, <clears throat> the first page, please. Um, I'm the also the uh, advisory board for the uh, newly established Japan International Dispute Resolution Center, uh, which is <clears throat> um, two years ago in Osaka established. And then this March, just before a planned Tokyo Olympic, we opened up the uh, uh, Tokyo's um, JIDRC, but uh, that's as you know, the uh, Tokyo Olympic is postponed. But still, you know, we have a lot of the uh, online system, and uh, uh, also, um, you know, we are promoting the uh, utilization of this uh, uh, dispute resolution center as a facility. This is not a, a institution. This is a facility <coughs> uh, in Tokyo and Osaka. Although uh, JCAA, uh, Japan Commercial Associ uh, Arbitration Association, Association has a uh, um, hearing room, but uh, uh, we have uh, opened this uh, huge uh, facility in Toronto, in Tokyo. And also, uh, <clears throat> the uh, one and a half year ago, uh, in Kyoto, we established Japan International Mediation Center in Kyoto. This is a mediation institution having its own mediation rule and a list of mediators for which I'm also as the uh, mediators and actually all mediators are, tr are trained by the uh, Singapore International Mediation Center as well uh, for the doing the uh, mediation. <clears throat> so um, this is uh, just a uh, news. And then uh, regarding the arbitration institutions, as uh, uh, many of you have um, aware of the Japan has the Japan Commercial Arbitration Association uh, JCAA, which is a um, arbitration associate uh, institution, which has its own rule and a list of the arbitrators, as well as the mediation rules and the mediation uh, administration, and also, especially for mainly for the domestic uh, construction area, we have uh, a Japan Real Estate Arbitration Institution, uh, which is a real estate ADR center, uh, but for cross border. Um, disputes, uh, cross-border arbitration. Uh, so we can have the uh, such global institutions uh, as well as this um, newly established Japan um, <coughs> institutions. So then uh, regarding the construction area, uh, as I mentioned, the, uh, the founder of the CIR is a construction engineer. So why the construction area is a so, um, you know, dispute a sort of a treasure and, and also uh, we have uh, uh, you know a kind of a characteristic of the uh, how to proceed with the uh, construction and the infrastructure uh, disputes so in, in other words the construction disputes is quite have a suitability for the ADL so first one is a high risk on disputes uh, during the um, the uh, uh, especially the complex and the growing uh, construction project. Uh, we have a uh, uh, lot of the uh, that issues could be coming up. And also complexity and needs expertise, engineer expert. Uh, so as I indicated, uh, you know, CIR's founder is also the engineer <coughs> of the construction and need resolution promptly or even the, as uh, uh, raised uh, for the, uh, from the participants, uh, we have a DAB you know, dispute as education board, uh, which is not so um, common, uh, frankly speaking, in, in Japanese domestic um, construction area, but still the cross-border, the global type of a big project 
even if you spend such expense for the establishing and the proceeding with the uh, DAB, that could be very helpful for uh, uh, simultaneous um, dispute uh, adjudication and uh, uh, also it's quite good for mitigation of uh, uh, high risk and expanding the uh, uh, disputes amount and the dispute range and uh, uh, points of the disagreement. And then uh, needs resolution property, property and the business common interest uh, between the uh, um, <clears throat> parties. Um, in other words, how to resolve the payment issues, how to save the cost. And uh, as uh, uh, Chris mentioned, the um, you know, Japanese construction, uh, construction companies has uh, um, a lot of the relationship and the future business and the ongoing business. And so for including the future business, you can have uh, a common interest because uh, rather than continuing to uh, uh, fight uh, forever, you know, you, you, you should uh, resolve the issue. And also uh, you can utilize the uh, future business uh, arrangement uh, for such uh, resolution. <clears throat> then need confidentiality, of course, you know, if you uh, have a dispute uh, in a court and the public, uh, then your reputation and the credibility in the market could be harmful. So this point is also uh, like how to protect the uh, those reputation and credibility it should be regarded as a common interest between the car parties. So then next page, please. <clears throat> My slide. Then a uh, uh, combination of the arbitration and the mediation for construction disputes. That's also uh, raised as a question from the audience. Of course, you should and you can um, think about and also provide uh, such a resolution clause uh, as the med up med and the up med up. Med up med means the uh, before going to the arbitration, you should have a mediation process in advance. Then you can, if, if you cannot resolve uh, the dispute by mediation, then you can step into the arbitration. And then if you agree uh, upon the, uh, uh, you know, okay, we can try the mediation again, then you can come back to the mediation. That's a med up med. Then another option is up med up. Uh, that's a, you don't have a, an advanced clause before the arbitration, uh, the mediation, but uh, uh, through the uh, arbitration, uh, the parties agree on the, okay, we should try the mediation because after, for example, uh, some sort of the discovery or a limited um, documentations uh, disclosures, then you can catch the point and then uh, you can, um, catch some common interest between the parties. So in that case, even if you uh, have a very strict dispute between the parties, but you can agree upon the uh, process of the, <coughs> how to uh, negotiate for the uh, possible mediation. So I've met, and then if you uh, collapse through the uh, mediation process, you can come back to the arbitration. Uh, but just a practical, sense the um especially med uh, med th this is good device this can be a good device but uh if you have a very unclear mediation um provision uh pre uh, as a pre-arbitration condition for example like if you in, in case you cannot resolve the disputes by mediation you can go to the arbitration how about that clause but um, how to determine the, you cannot resolve the mediation could be quite unclear. Then that could trigger another dispute. So uh, you should be really carefully um, providing and fixing the uh, such uh, <clears throat> in advance mediation clause. So according to my experience, such uh, med up clause sometimes uh, could be troublesome if uh, the, <clears throat> uh, contracting wording of the mediation clause is poor, then that could be uh, quite troublesome. So um, practical tip is the, for this type of a combination of a med up and up med, that's good, but you should really consult with the uh, nice dispute resolution lawyer, uh, even if you have the uh, 
uh, construction contracting. Then the uh, flexible utilization of the uh, facilities and institutions. As I indicated, um, we established a JIDLC as a new e facility and the JIMC uh, Kyoto uh, as a new institution. Uh, just one thing, why we establish the uh, mediation center in Kyoto is we um, found, uh, we, we regard Kyoto as a sort of a Japan, Hawaii. I mean, you know, Hawaii is actually a very good place for mediation because, you know, during the mediation, the settlement negotiation, uh, it's a really amicable, you know, nice atmosphere. And then we try to find where is the Hawaii in Japan? Maybe it should be Kyoto. So, you know, it's a kind of amicable, uh, nice atmosphere. And then we uh, could utilize the uh, Doshi University's <coughs> facilities in JMC. And then we established the uh, new rule and the mediators list. So then JCAA we have already and other foreign institutions such as uh, uh, Singapore International <coughs> Arbitration uh, Center and HKIAC and ICC. So even for such <coughs> institutions and administered uh, arbitration uh, can be utilize can, can utilize uh jidrc so you you can have a lot of options you know <clears throat> for jimc mediation can be conducted in jidrc and also jc um in, uh, arbitration can be held in jidrc so it, you you have a lot of options but uh, from the overseas um especially from the overseas uh users and even from the uh, in house seats, you know, we, we have a various institutions and uh, um, facilities. So it's a little bit um, co confusing situation, but, you know, please uh, do think about such options. And then nicely um, provided meta clothes or our med clothes could be, especially for the uh, constructions area. I think that could be helpful. Then uh, regarding the uh, another topic is the online and the web virtual ADR system. <clears throat> so cross-border construction infrastructure dispute resolution, uh, including the investment treaty type of disputes, uh, especially under the uh, current COVID-19 situation, a lot of the institutions and the facilities, uh, like Maxwell Chambers, ICCs, and uh, ICSID, has establishing the uh, a lot of the program for such uh, COVID-19 program. And uh, one big uh, good example is the Singapore International Mediation Center, STMC, has, uh, um, it, it, it's, it's promoting the COVID-19 uh, sort of a discount program. Uh, I think that could be very uh, good device also. Then future perspective, cost, timing, availability, even after COVID-19 um, issues. I think uh, to some extent, such online dispute resolution would be uh, one big option because that can save the, uh, the party's time and also uh, the very high repu reputable and uh, uh, very famous uh, arbitrators, very, very busy. You know, they are uh, almost always on the airplane, but, uh, you know, you can save their timing and uh, uh, for their availability. I think such online dispute resolution is a very a big advantage. And uh, two weeks ago, the Nikkei newspaper in Japan uh, has uh, <clears throat> provided their article on the online uh, civil dispute resolution. And I, I commented on the, uh, the recent uh, development of the JIDRC's uh, online system. For those cross-border construction disputes, I think that could be a, a good device. Then just, uh, it's not that uh, <clears throat> a fo focus on the construction, but the uh, Singapore Convention Enforceability issue, uh, as, uh, uh, as you know, the, uh, uh, it's coming up. And uh, I understand already 52 countries signed up for the uh, uh, Singapore Convention, uh, which is the uh, uh, enforceability of the uh, settlement uh, for uh, cross-border uh, agreement, then the Japanese government is now discussing, including the possible amendment of the uh, domestic, law, domestic laws for the enforcement. 
And so especially for enforceability of the uh, construction disputes and the settlement, I think the, we, we'll see what is going on. And, but even before Japanese signing up of the uh, such Singapore Convention, uh, for example, the uh, JIMC's um, mediation settlement agreement, uh, if that settlement agreement is going to be enforced in US, for example, that's already uh, within the scope of the uh, Singapore Convention because US uh, is uh, already signed up uh, the uh, Singapore Convention. So for all those cross-border uh, mediation field uh, for which the construction disputes could be um, you know, utilized, I think we, we, we should watch and uh, we should handle uh, how to proceed with the uh, Singapore Convention's, uh, you know, the issues and uh, carefully uh, reaching the uh, settlement. So uh, it's really uh, timing up. So uh, this is my uh, end, end of the, my presentation. Thank you. Takatori-san, th thank you very much for those comments and thank you for addressing also the, the audience questions that, that had uh, come through prior to the session. I mean, I, I'm conscious there are quite a number of other questions that we've not had an opportunity to get to. Um, so, so I apologize to the audience for that. My, my screen is flashing a time up message at me, courtesy of the uh, SIAC uh, BD folks. So I think it, it falls to me now simply to thank all of our panelists, thank all of our audiences, Hopefully there'll be a chance to, to regroup and address some of those uh, questions we didn't get a chance to cover. But for now, again, thank you and uh, goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.